On today's IUC people, I'm joined by Judy and Julian Cook, who are well known to many of us who've been part of IUC for a long time. But uh, today we're going to have a chance to dig a little bit deeper and hear some of their history and uh, what they've been doing with their lives, and I'm sure it's going to be very fascinating. So welcome, Judy and Julian. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Thanks for asking us. <laughs> so, Judy, maybe I'll start with you. <laughs> Take us take us back to the to the beginning. You know, tell us a little bit about your 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 family background and where you grew up and mm -hmm. you know school days. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Johannesburg. Was born in Johannesburg. My parents came to South Africa in 1939 at the outbreak of the Second World War, having left Germany and England because my father was a mechanical engineer selling machine tools in Berlin very successfully, mm. but they, he was there during the rise of Nazism and he met my mother there who was also there with her older sister and um, they saw what was happening around them and they decided no, they had to get away from this and they left Germany and they came back to England and in England they were offered, my father was offered a job in Johannesburg as director of a machine tool company and he decided to take it and leave Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they had two small children and they came separately. My mother on her own with the two children in a boat, never sure whether the U boats were going to get them or, uh, and my father in another boat also, similarly. But they both ended up safely in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And then moved in Johannesburg, we were. And um, my father took off. I mean, it was a magnificent job opportunity for him on a scale which he wouldn't have had and a freedom in Europe mm -hmm. and so um, my mother sadly uh, lost my elder sister who was a little tall girl of two mm -hmm. and she was killed in a dreadful accident and um, my mother was completely overwhelmed by that but they decided the two of them if they're going to make it in this country and not run away back home in the middle of war, they're going to have more children. So they had me first, and then my younger sister came. Mm -hmm. And so we were two little bosom buddy sisters mm -hmm. and grew up together as close as two things like that. And um, I think we brought our, our parents some comfort, I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this presence that we had lost, somebody very precious. Uh, when they first came to this country. Yeah, so then my father was earning well and they had a house and they chose the poshest school they could think of to send us to. Mm -hmm. And so we went to a very posh school. And um, there, I mean, I had privileges like you can't believe, like, well, you can believe, but really good piano lessons, um, very good coaching with the gym and sports and things like that, good teaching, lots of friends. I was very happy at school. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it, yeah. And uh, so we were very lucky and very, very privileged. But as time went by, um, the nationalists came into power in 1948. Mm -hmm. In 1952, they increased their majority, much to the horror of the United Party, which was the opposition, the Unsmanses Party at that time. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget the picture of watching my mother sitting in the bed, sobbing and sobbing as she read the results in the newspaper that morning. And we were a politically involved family, they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, she'd come from a family of feminists and um, Labour supporters in, in England, and she was very much uh, in, aware and alert of that. So we talked and talked, there was always politics being talked at home, what was going to happen. And um, over time, then gradually, the, the beginning of apartheid was beginning to actually bite. My parents took part in things like bus boycott. They would leave at five in the morning, drive out to early time at time, pick up people so that they didn't have to pay the terrible extra, which they couldn't afford to pay on the back of buses. That kind of thing. So we were very aware of all this going on. <clears throat> and then came the the. Um, uh, the packing of the Senate and the determination by the Nationalist government to get coloured people off the voters' roll. And 
um, then the creation of the defense of the Constitution League, which was the name of the Black Sash. Mm -hmm. So there were these women, all of them women married to, you know, businessmen and, you know, white, well, or preferred conservative people. Um, but the women were going to do something. Mm -hmm. And my mother was going to do something. And she moved in boots and all, and she became organizer of the demonstrations and was very, very active. So we had sessions at home making posters, and we had all sorts of stuff going on there. Uh, that was 1957. Yeah. Wow. So. Uh, you were nurtured into an activist family yes. right from day one. From day one, and I would say a key turning point for me was at age 12, being taken to see Crown of the Lover Country and in Clayton's mm. book, which we made a movie on, mm. watching it in the Victory Cinema in Orange Grove, and just thinking, this is this is heartbreaking. I can't can't bear this. I actually, it is so unfair. This this person, this lovely young man coming to Joburg from this wonderful family in the countryside and the ruination that faced him and the, 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 the sheer cruelty and oppression of it all and I then felt I can't stand this. this the social injustice is too much and so I was placed after they'd seen that movie irrevocably in a certain place politically. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll talk about more of that as we go along. But Julian, was, tell us about your childhood background. <laughs> well, in, in a certain respect, uh, it's rather similar. My parents also both came from the UK, uh, but my father came when he was 10 years old as a little boy who was left on the farm out in the middle of uh, old Transvaal in those days. And my mother came out sort of seeking I think to get out of the British class system, quite honestly. <laughs> and um, she came when she was 18 years old. And then the rest of her family followed a couple of years later, in fact. So so, um, so I was I was born in Joburg. And really, uh, my childhood was just carefree. <laughs> you know, we had, um, my, my father was caught up during the war. So in fact, I didn't really know him for the first five years of my life. And in fact, I, I don't even remember him coming home. So there was obviously a lot of rejection. I'd had my mother for five years <laughs> while this other bloke comes along. But anyway, um, so um, so uh, I also went to my mother taught, and she taught at St. John's College in Joburg, the posher school there. So we got a cheap way in there. And so we also went to a very posh school just up the road from where Judy was. And um, so, and, and my family was, my father was an incredibly hard, he was an architect and an incredibly hard working man. So I mean, he worked every night that I can remember as a child, up till 12 o'clock. And he worked over the, uh, on Saturday and came home at four o'clock in the afternoon and he did a bit on Sunday night as well. He was a very, very hard working person. So we were quite an isolated family, I would say, really. And but we had we had fantastic holidays. They did very adventurous camping holidays. So we really looked at the whole of Zimbabwe and Mozambique and, mm -hmm. and all around South Africa. And we had this farm that because my mother's parents went and farmed up near Utrecht in uh, what's now in Popo. And uh, we went. We spent a lot of time in outdoors there. So you know a lot of my now love of outdoors and so on comes from those those days. So, but apart from that, it was, it was just a completely carefree, we, 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 I was aware of uh, things going on. I do remember when I, I suppose I must have been 12, when there were, um, there were moving people, and we could almost see it from our house going on, it was um, it's a fire town. It's a fire town. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember saying to my parents, what's going on? And, you know, they, they couldn't really explain. But mm -hmm. That, well, they knew, but I mean, it was difficult to explain to a child what was going on. So, so I would say I was, by the, it was only really when I met Judy, and we met, by the way, when we were children, when we were 16 years old. Wow. So, and we were already in love when we were 16 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, here we are still. Uh, <laughs> so, 64 uh, years later. Yeah. So, so, it was really only when when I met her and got, uh, and got to uh, a sense of what her family was about and what his, what his interest and involvement was. And then when I started at university, it was reinforced there. 
Yeah. And because the universities were getting involved with protesting and so on against uh, the, the increasingly uh, drastic uh, uh, content legislations. Okay, so tell us a bit about what happened when you left the school. And so I start with you, Judy. I mean, did you go and study? What, you know, did, as you were growing up, did you have a sense of what you wanted to do with your life? I thought I was going to be a Latin teacher. A Latin teacher. A Latin teacher. <laughs> I love Latin. I'm a wonderful Latin teacher. Um, so I thought I was going to be a teacher. Mm. But um, I, uh, my parents said, you have what we didn't call a bend in those days, but a gap there. You have a year where you can get some other skills. Mm. You can get some bookkeeping and typing and uh, shorthand skills, mm. and you can get a job, you can look for a job, and you can finish your piano licentiate. Mm. So I had those lovely piano lessons, and I got to a certain level, and so I had a great year of working with a, quite a stormy teacher, I must say, but she, she was very good and got my piano license in that year. Mm. And during that year, I also was very active, I became very strongly active in the Black Sash. Mm. So um, in Joburg, my mother was a you know committee member and everything was all right here <coughs> at her hand. And so um, I joined protests and stands, and Julian and I, I was in 17, were involved. Mm. So who guess who comes along and stands at this, and it's him too. So there's, and his mates. So, so, so there used to be this kind of uh, heading off sensation, standing there, you know, with your black sash on, totally silent, and just receiving whatever was coming at you from the, from the car windows or from the road or whatever. And um, the one big stand I will never forget is the defense of the flame of freedom, we call it. We had a little flame of freedom behind the Joburg City Hall, uh, which was where all the buses parked and were set off from. Mm. Uh, and so all the bus conductors and the drivers and so on were all there. Mm. And this is where we had the flame of freedom because they had just passed the 90-day uh, detention without trial. Mm. So you could be held 90 days in prison without trial and no access to a lawyer, nothing. Mm. Well, this was the format of the, of the, of the legislation, but more and more so. But at that time, and so there we were standing. And this was a time when I had a famous tomato or egg or something grilled at me, and the, and the um, burger comes along the newspaper and takes a photograph, and I'm so angry mm. holding this thing that's being hurled at me. And, and the burger said, she looks as if she could also throw a pretty at something pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> so they turned it upside down on you. Mm. you know? So, you know, there were those, those kind of experiences. So that was that year. And then, then going down to university, mm. which was quite a different job. So what did yeah. you study at university? I studied, well, I wanted to be a Latin teacher. So I studied Latin and was so bored. <laughs> Unbelievably badly taught, and there were all these dreary legal law students wanting to do law. They also had to do that. Which university were you at? U university of Cape Town. Oh, so that, that's what brought you to Cape Town initially? Yes, and that, that was a deliberate strategy of my parents because they saw how Julian and I were going, and they felt. You weren't ready. You we weren't to... ready. No, come on now, let's mm -hmm. have a little separation here. So when I went to university in East, uh, UCT and he stayed at Pitts. And did it work? Did you stay in touch or...? <laughs> no, we <laughs> sort of broke up. Oh. Well, darling, maybe you... Well, we, 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 did, we did break up. I mean, uh, Judy's father was very sweet. He said he, he took me to, to lunch and he said I was a very nice guy and one day perhaps I'd marry his daughter and he'd be pleased. But meanwhile, we were much too young and so we did actually break up and we... Uh, for for three years, really, yeah. or two, yeah. two and a half years, we, we had a little bit of contact in between, but nothing nothing very active. Or, or, uh, so so we did in fact do that. And so at that period, at, over that period, I was when I started university, I was absolute delinquent. So I, I don't know whether Julie had some control over my life, but when she wasn't there. I was really behaved very badly on the one hand, but then on the other hand, I was, uh, you know, because being at the university and mixing with a whole lot of different people and sort of just beginning to get involved with my subject, 
My father was an architect, so I was going to be an architect, and that wasn't a very difficult choice. <laughs> but I, so I was sort of starting to get a little bit uh, connected with it. Was it was it something you felt imposed on you, or did you actually really want to be an architect? No, I, I felt as if I really wanted to, but you know, I also wanted to be a teacher. My mother was a teacher, so, <laughs> so it, sort of psychologically, I'm not sure how much was conscious and how much was just you know, it was like an easy route. Yeah, uh, I could draw a bit, you know. I learned to draw a bit, so and I, I was good at maths, and they said, you know, good at art, you know, and maths, and you can you can do it. So, so you were fits. I you? was at bits, yeah. Right. And so I, I did, I mean, uh, I, I did start also, even though I was very wild um, uh, over that period, um, I, uh, I did also start to uh, get to understand what the political situation was and, and start, I wouldn't say become more involved, but sort of become sort of almost like culturally involved, you know, got involved with interested in music and we used to spend a lot of time at down at the bottom of Joburg, a place called Dorke House, where all the great musicians, you know, they used to come and play. Mm. Uh, on a Sunday evening, we used to go down there. And then there was there was another one in Hillbro that we used to go to also. They, they were a little bit illegitimate for white people to be there, but that was part of the sort of game that I was playing really at that at that stage. One was trying to find some way of making a connection. I think. Mm -hmm. Over that over that period, sort of between I was eighteen and, and twenty one, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then in, and then in fourth, you know, architecture had a fourth year, which is uh, you, you leave the university, you, you've got to go and work, mm -hmm. and you you can also travel, and the travel takes uh, it, it, you can do instead of the work part of it. So in fact, I went to uh, we got engaged. So we were 21, I was 21, too. So you managed to get engaged even though you were still at BITS and you were at UCT? Yes. But now we got together again, yeah. Yeah. But, but from distance, so how did that From work? a distance, well, I, I, my home was in Germany. So, <laughs> so, so you I would come back home. In term breaks and things? In term breaks, and in one term break, we had, there was an architectural golf match or something, I don't know what it was, and we saw each other and boop, there it was again. Right. So, uh, so it started up again, and at the end of my third year, end of his, uh, yeah, we got engaged, yeah. uh, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, so then I, I went and had a year in Europe, uh, or nine months anyway. I worked there and I hitched, I hitched around the continent, mm -hmm. and it, it was a very powerful thing really in my life. You know, mm -hmm. and, Whereabouts in Europe? Uh, you know, I worked in the UK, but we hitchhiked up to uh, um, Sweden and Finland, and then right down to, to Italy and back up through France. So we really did the grand tour, as they say. And I really, I think that was when I really saw architecture proper for the first time and started to see what a wonderful, you know, the thing it was to get into. Really, that was so. That was when I was you know, twenty-one. Yeah, you know, I was. Yeah. You know. And he was away so for nine months. But he wrote these magnificent letters. Mm -hmm. So we would get, uh, he'd write the family or for me, and we hear of all these things, and we get those letters. And they were so special. In, in those days, though, you know, if you wrote a letter, it would well, take a month to arrive or something. No, no, no. no, no, no. no. Oh, that's it's a letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, uh, a letter from the UK would get here in three, to three or four days. Wow, okay. yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe a, a, a week if you were out from Finland or something. Oh, yeah. 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 Much, much better than that. So we kept contact that way and and um, kept in touch. Uh, but then, when I finished my degree, I did English and I dropped Latin off one year like a hot cake. I just couldn't bear it. It was so dreary. And and focused on history and English and thought, I think, I'm not sure which, but I'm both of them I love. But I did very little work. I had a ball. I had a very <laughs> Light for the hearts of daytime, but at the same time, there was um, stuff going on at the university a lot because 1959, which is the sort of second year I was there, uh, the legislation came in saying only whites can leave this university, mm -hmm. no more blacks and colored people anymore, thank you. And so there was a huge uproar mm -hmm. at the university and protests and demonstrations, and we were part of all that and got to know people and sort of watched from a distance. There were Ruben and um, all those famous people mm. taking a lead uh, in fear and trembling, we watched them and admired them. 
But I joined the Progressive Party at that stage mm -hmm. and was sort of a more in a more liberal uh, realm in a way. Um, and and canvassed for Colin Edwin. And so I'm persuaded my friends too. So that was my political home in a way then. Mm. Uh, okay. And so when did this engagement turn into marriage? Well, we, uh, uh, when I got back from uh, well, my fourth year in 1962, Julie left to go to the UK to do. Uh, <laughs> to do a, 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 a part of your father's strategy, wasn't it? Yeah, she, she did a postgraduate thing in, in uh, education. She, in, 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 there was a, the, the, sorry to interrupt you, but the degree here was a four year degree. And I said, please, is there any way I can do something more interesting? Institute of Education in London University, maybe. So we applied and I got in. Mm. And there I did uh, learn to be a teacher of English mm. at the Institute of Education in London. I went over from that academic year. Well, better, you know, the, the, yeah. the home of proper English. Oh, <laughs> yes. So, but then, meanwhile, then I was I was finishing off my architectural thing here, yeah. and by then I was a, I, I grew up a bit in that. And uh, I started to take life a little bit more seriously, so I got on the events of its SRC. And the SRC was obviously politically involved all over the show. So, uh, you know, that, that aspect of me grew. And I was chairman of the Arts Festival Committee. Wow. So I had to organize this big arts festival, which was a, an amazing thing to do, actually. And, and again, one of the things was music, you know, the local Af African jazz bands. So I got to know quite a lot of the players. You know, mm -hmm. we had a guy, uh, Gideon Kumara, and uh, Dudu Bakwana, Kiki Mukietsi, they were quite yeah. well known yeah. names. And so I got to know them quite well as, mm -hmm. as uh, sort of people that I knew. And mm -hmm. uh, when we organized, for instance, the Architects Bri, you know, the, the, the fact that we would have a Bri. We would get somebody like Kipu Mukherjee to come and play on your uh, on your saxophone there, and because you know he he was poor and needed money, you know. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't try and do it uh, through any legitimate way. We just simply went or had them come, and and that was hard work. But we were aware all the time that it, it wasn't legitimate. Yeah. You know. So I assume after all this, at some point you finally got married. Yes, and then. Mm -hmm. um, a new adventure started formally together. Sort of, you, you came back from the UK, Judy. Yeah. Yeah. So you started your married life in Joburg, was it? And then I think yeah. uh, it must have been. You know, tell us about how that progressed. Well, you know, uh, birth control wasn't very good in there. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a bit of birth control. It was actually a big issue because the, the birth control was changing the world in all sorts of ways yeah. just around that yeah. period. But anyway, Judy was pregnant quite soon. Yeah. And uh, like within a year anyway. And within uh, four months. And then, uh, and then, but meanwhile, I made an application for a, an Italian government bursary, which I got. And so we, we were duly, uh, when we left, probably six, five or six months pregnant, mm. we, we left for Europe again. And um, uh, we went to England first and then across to Italy. And so, so we really had a year in Italy, um, mm. uh, which was absolutely amazing. Where in Italy? In Venice. Venice. Yeah. We lived in Venice. Yeah. Magical <coughs> city. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, it was amazing. And it was amazing for us too as a couple because we were really independent for the first time, properly independent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we often were hungry. We we ate chicken necks and uh, and uh, potatoes and uh, carrots, you know, because we didn't get very much out of the bursary. No. Well, yeah. I thought you'd be eating pasta and uh, you know uh, lots of Italian <laughs> too, but, uh, and lots of it. <laughs> so, so it was it was a, it was a very a very great memorable year. Yeah. And our son Justin was born there. Mm. So. Um, so we had this little boy, and I used to wheel him around very proud in the piazzas. Mm -hmm. And all, uh, all the mamas and papas coming and looking with it, they wouldn't believe he was a boy. Mm -hmm. They said, be not a boba, be no, 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 too pretty, too pretty. <laughs> and I must tell you, the papas were very interested, in, and I thought, gosh, I didn't even knew men so interested in babies until, <laughs> I, heard one of, until I heard one of them say, 
Cara, mamma, cara, mamma. Ma è che vuoi succedere? So there was Justin, and then uh, you had more children after that. Yeah, well, you yes, that. Yes, but we had decided we were not going back to South Africa. It was 65, you know, Mandela and everybody were in Northern Ireland. It was just going one way. And we said, no, we're not going back. But mm -hmm. then Julian's father in his architectural practice was going, taking off in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And he offered Julian a partnership in that architectural practice. Right. And he said, come back, we'll pay for your trip back and you will have a partnership. And I longed to show my baby to my family and to my friends. Mm. And I was quite lonely, although the Italians love babies and they were around all the time. Not family. Not family. Yeah. So, so we decided we'll give it five years. If we get there and it's still the same in five years, we're leaving. Mm. Ha, ha. <laughs> By that time, life had... Again, dealt us another <laughs> play or two. Well, by then we had another two children. Another two five, bouncing yeah. boys. Well, we had a work yeah. control issue again. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had to work pretty hard. To, I had to work pretty hard to, to, to keep this family going. So um, so it, it was actually almost impossible to leave yeah. at, at that stage. Yeah. So, we, so we then settled into... I settled into uh, working as an architect, mm -hmm. and um, Judy did a lot of staying at home looking after kids, but she also taught in a school. When the little one, the littlest one was little, oh, then I'm going to talk. I couldn't get a job as a married woman teaching English, unless I went to write, you know, into the Bundu somewhere, mm -hmm. miles away. No job for, for an English high school teacher, so I taught primary school. And I, I loved that, it was great. Mm. And it was a wonderful career to have with three small boys because mm. I was at home in the afternoons and we had school holidays together and it worked very, very well. And Julian was meantime bringing in not very much bacon, but enough. <laughs> <laughs> sure. sure. Okay. So um, you're starting to progress in your career, Julian, with, with your you know, being a partner in a practice with your, with your father. Mm. Children growing up, um, what was the next big change in life? You know, what was the next big turning point, would you say? Well, I, I mean, I, I think for, uh, for, for me, um, it, it was, I did, I did a postgraduate uh, thing part time uh, over that period in town planning, so I had another degree. Um, and and then uh, and then I changed from practice to teaching. I taught for two years at Pitts. Mm -hmm. It was 1974, 75. And at that meanwhile, Judy was seriously involved with the Black Sand. You were you were still about that, I mean, Chris. Yeah. yeah. So so um, I became part of the Transvaal Committee and um, that uh, was very very active and was part of running the Saturday Club, which was a club of mothers and children, mm. Soweto and um, our areas as well. And we also would just visit each other so that our kids could play together and be together and we could be together and we could talk. And it was at one of those gatherings that the mother said to me, Judy, we've, our boys are 15 years old, they're going to face each other at the end of a gun. Not like this kicking a ball to each other across the lawn. Mm. And it was a big warning. That was, uh, that was 74, yes, around mm. about 74. Mm. Mm. So the, the, the sash thing was very, very important. Yeah. And it was um, uh, Die French Breitach from a cathedral was accused of inciting us to violence, which was a spy who was put in there, mm. who posed as a black sash in Brazil. But, but um, he was sent back to England, extradited. Um, but the cathedral was a great resource to me because um, there, there was a wonderful priest called Father Leo Rakari, who was a, an island of peacefulness and acceptance and hope. And our kids could go there and they could sit in Sunday school with a black teacher and have black kids sitting with them and be together. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, a, a huge escape hatch, the church and the sash. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I want to get on at some point to talk about 
Bay of Human, obviously, yeah. made it to yeah. ABC and to what extent that sure. was an issue with your life. But obviously, at some point, you made the move to Cape Town. Yeah. And, and what brought you down here? Well, I got a job to teach. I taught two years of business and then I applied for one in Cape Town and I got one. I had a senior, senior lectureship, so it was a great opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. So so we, we took it and we got into our copy and drove down. <laughs> I've been here ever since. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, that's more than 40 years ago, yeah. yeah. And so you taught at UCT uh, from then on? From then on, yeah. I, I taught I taught then from the beginning of 76 until 2000. Yeah. So, and you know, it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't easy moving to Cape Town. I mean, Cape Town's known for being a rather snooty place. And it's... <laughs> And it's, it, it wasn't, you know, we had to find new friends and get to understand how things worked and how the city worked and mm. sort of get it culturally accustomed to it and so on and so on. So it was quite tough, really. And meanwhile, you know, I wasn't earning very much at the university mm. and we had three children who were spending a lot. So I had to work pretty hard both in my career and also I, I got into a partnership outside of it mm. to kind of supplement that. So, so I'd say the first first few years that we were back here really we, we put our heads down and we mm. and we and we worked really at our careers and and then well then Judy actually changed career. Judy Julian I'd just like to sort of talk a little bit more about you know how you your architecture career how that developed all those years at UCT and you know some private practice but you know I know you've been involved in different projects over the years yeah. which are sort of you know marrying if you're if you like, with your passion to make a difference in the world. Maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, I think it actually started at university, but I think of it, it started in that fifth year when I ran that uh, uh, part of the SRC. And, mm-hmm. and by the time I did my architectural thesis, where you, you design a building, or you used to just design a building, I did choose to do a community centre in Soweto. So, so, I mean, I think that already showed us a particular focus, you know, other people might have been doing a resort in Durban or something, but yes. it, was, it was already a sort of a bit of a choice. And when I came down here and started teaching, the School of Architecture itself was starting to play a role. They, they, because of the difficulty of getting black students, the school actually started an arrangement with the uh, Technicon in uh, Masiru in, in Lesotho with, with, with a, an arrangement and a couple of our staff went in got a little architectural section going, so we, Judy and I had both went up there once and sort of looked around there and spent some time. So there was quite a lot of that kind of activity going on from the School of Architecture itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I was involved with the early research with uh, early learning centres in, in Cape Town when I started at UCT, so, um, so I was looking at how you build, um, uh, how you design early learning centres uh, in, in poor areas and so on. So that was also part of it. And then, well, then it was really only in 1985 when I'd I'd been here for 10 years already, when um, through David Russell, who was the famous Anglican priest in in Cape Town, became Bishop of Grahamstown, he called in Paul Andrew, who was a friend of mine who had experience in heart. I'd worked with Paul on a couple of things, and we worked very well together. And Paul called me in, and the idea was that there was this group of hospital dwellers that David Russell knew who wanted to upgrade their living conditions. And so through that, I got involved with this hostels upgrade project, which was a really a completely community generated project that started in 1985, which was this was a terrible time in this country. Mm-hmm. State of emergency. emergency, you know, it was it was really the most awful time mm-hmm. yeah, politically and socially it was it, it sort of burns in you that time. Mm-hmm. And um, but anyway, so it was a fantastic opportunity really for me because I wasn't really a kind of political animal that wanted to go marching down streets and uh, going to meetings and things that, and canvassing. I couldn't handle that sort of part of politics at all. But it was an opportunity where I could play some sort of role through the work that I did. So it was really amazing. So I got involved with this group, and then I worked with them for well for fifteen years actually. But the first, uh, probably the 1985 to 1993, that, uh, those were the sort of crucial years. And um, I became the chairman of the Western Cape Hospital Dwellers uh, Trust, and, and, and then they formed an NGO called Umsamo Development Trust, which I was also an early chair, chair of, and so on, that went through that. 
And, and it was really, in a way, that was the best experience of my life. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I sort of got to know people of this country as really close friends who might had no opportunity to, to connect with before that. Mm -hmm. And there were hard times, so we had to we had to keep our stamina going. You know, mm -hmm. Fight like man, we we came right up against the brutal arm of apartheid. You know, people were assassinated. Friends of mine were assassinated. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, oh. and yeah. And I was going to say, Julian, it continues to this day. I know you're involved with even in retirement. Uh, in your <laughs> Well, well, in, in, in retirement, there's a, there's a group in, um, uh, in called Bags, called the Bakers. It's actually a group that Judy belongs to, but I've sort of got uh, connected with them. And they're, they're, they're basically activists of our sort of age or a little bit younger. Horst Leinschmidt is a well known ANC person who mm -hmm. looked after Mandela's children and that sort of thing. You know, so crucial man, he's part of it. And they basically got fussing around my for Mulele. So I've, I've got a bit involved with that fuss. We've been recently to see the mayor about that. And and then and then I've also been working on this idea of I had this idea of um, it was it was an idea of actually having ten dreams of a of a of a, of a great Cape Town. Mm -hmm. What would it be like? And it's now become a vision for a future Cape Town. So I've been working on this exhibition really. For a number of years now, and it's actually opening next week or a week after next, so the first of July, mm -hmm. which is uh, it's got about 50 50 panels of which is, which is really aimed to show what a, a fairer, more um, uh, uh, economical, more sustainable, uh, more safe Cape Town would look like. That's that's the idea of it. So that's been that's been a lot of work actually. And I assume, as a teacher, Julian, you've played a role in shaping and nurturing future architects for Cape Town, you know, others and, you know, over the years, you know, with the shifts that you see, mm -hmm. with, you know, changing demographic of students coming mm -hmm. in. You know, um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I left UCT full-time in 2000, which is quite a long time ago now, um, but I, I, I stayed teaching as a part-time right up until 2016, I think it was, uh, peace must fall around that, that period then. So, and that's really when the major transformation has happened from 2000, to, there were obviously black uh, students before that, but the, the, the sort of real shift over has happened <coughs> since 2000 really. And so I have only been peripherally involved with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And Judy, I mean, you know, obviously, having three young children was occupying a lot of your time in the early years, but I know that then, you know, subsequently you got involved with all kinds of different things, uh, with working with young people with, with disabilities and, uh, you know, with FAMSA. So maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Mm. Yes, I think, you know, Julian, just going back to when we first came to Cape Town, mm. it was a difficult time for us. Mm. Um, and we, we um, Julian, um, made it possible for me to go and finish my UNISA in psychology degree, which I've been doing for mm. UNISA, at UCT because mm. he was teaching so we could get the fare, the fees mm. were a quarter fees or something like that. So I transferred and I started doing that and I did my honours in psychology at UCT mm. and it was all wound up and excited to go on and do a clinical master's degree there. Oh. But my working, we both, he was working for that time, I was working for that time. Mm. The children were newly in Cape Town, new schools, mm. new everything. And it was actually too much. Mm. Um, and, and so I stepped aside from the career path which I could have taken then. And I decided to go back to teaching. Mm. And I got a job at the Vera School for Autistic Children. Mm -hmm. And that was the most extraordinary, eye-opening experience, amazing experience. And um, so I worked there, and I've stayed connected with intellectual disability ever since. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing uh, part of my heart and my dedication, really, is, is there. And so from there, I was 
appointed a coordinator of a West UK forum for intellectual disability, a new organization that was trying to coordinate all the different separate little centers, all for white kids, mm. all over Cape Town. They didn't talk to each other, but all had the recipe behind to sort out kids with intellectual disability or mental retardation, as it was called then. Um, and so, so that was a wonderful thing. And what emerged was there were no centers, day centers, for black or colored kids in Cape mm. Town. And at that stage, it was all for whites. And the, the, then Cape Mental Health offered me a job to come and help establish day centers. And that was a wonderful opportunity. So I joined Cape Mental Health and we got these centers going with the parents in Brussels Plain, in Gugnetu, in retreats. And, and there they are, strong and thriving, you know, which was just a wonderful, a wonderful thing to do. She was mugged twice during the uh, run, by the way. I'm hard to Google it. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, anyway. Um, meantime, I was very, very interested in the whole community development. I mean, working with parents, seeing what they were coping with in which was playing and in retreat and in community. And, and then FAMSA came along, and I did a course at FAMSA in community Just for listeners who don't know what FAMSA is. FAMSA, FAMSA stands for Families South Africa. Mm. So it's, it's an NGO that works with counselling families. Mm. Started off the war when mm. many marriages were under huge threat, mm. uh, with a split from, you know, the husband and wife split over five or six years. So mm. that's when it started. Um, so it's a counselling organisation for mm. family relationships, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I joined as community coordinator at FAMSA. Mm. And then they had this amazing task of trying to get FAMSA uh, out of this, well not out, but stay in FAMSA <laughs> a bit. Um, instead of being, you come to FAMSA in the centre of town uh, for a 15 minute of, uh, um, into a counselling session and then you go home again and no question about you'd come from Kainichi yeah. mm. all the way for this one 50 minute session about your marriage or whatever mm. and so we started establishing different centres in different township areas so that was part of that and I suppose the highlight there was really the training of community counsellors um, using FAMSA's basic model, which was the classic therapeutic psycho analytic psychodynamic model. It was that, but it was hugely formed by what we experienced there. Mm. Taxi violence, um, all sorts of stuff going on in there. How could they make a one hour training session in Google to regularly always? No. Mm. So we had negotiations around how. What? Because they were going to get a proper, a good certificate and they were going to be counsellors. And so that was an a, a extraordinary experience. Uh, like Julian, I met and made friends in that process. Um, and so today, I mean, we, you know, years and years later, I still have contact with some of them and work with some of them still. So I've always felt, you know, Julian and I have had a lot of work in therapy. We used therapy a lot. So right in Joburg, in the early days, um, with our first parenting thing, we had very good psychologist friends and, and um, talked with them and they said, ah, why don't you go and have a session going to a psychologist? What? We're not mad. We don't need to go to a psychologist. And, and but going to a psychologist and learning. Becoming part of encounter groups. Yeah. That whole movement we were part of. So we had a wonderful, Parallel education in in ourselves in a way and and others and relationships uh, as we were going along and and so which needless to say sustained our relationship yes it well, did we over, over all the bumps and humps well, well yes, it's been uh, sixty four years or something since yeah. it started so it's, it's a been a, it's been a tool that has been so useful to us yeah can I ask you just another question that's uh, and it's to do with, you know, you, you've made it to IUC and this has been your church community and mm -hmm. you've been part of this place for quite some time mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, you haven't, neither of you have spoken really about, you know, um, 
your your own background in church, you know, with, with your family sort of part of the church, you were brought up in a Christian tradition. Um, could you maybe just share a little bit about, you know, um, how you found your way to RUC and maybe what had shaped your faith tradition before that? Mm-hmm. Start with you, Judy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we had a conventional Anglican um, bringing, upbringing as children sent to Sunday school and church. Mm. But my parents were not interested really, but impressed by Trevor Huddleston and Bishop Reed mm. and what they were doing politically mm. and saying. And so they had a door, a foot in their, that door mm. and became members of the Anglican Church. Mm. Um, and um, so there was that. Um, and then I think where after after the Joburg thing. The first the first uh, thing that I was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the first was Finn and Stuart when they came. They met your parents. There was an English couple yes. who met Judy's parents at their and church. Yes. And, and, and 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 Judy's parents said to us, "Wouldn't we like to meet them? Because we, she, they thought we'd get on well with them, which we did, and we got on very well with them." Mm. And uh, a fellow there, the, 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 the woman part of the, of the couple, was, was a very passionate Christian woman. Yes, she was. So, so I think that, so we started to talk a lot with them and go to church with them sometimes and mm-hmm. that sort of thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was when we were about, so our children were like, just was probably 10 years old or something like that. But it wasn't like you being raised going to church as children yourselves, either. No, I, I wasn't. I, I, I mean, I think my parents. See, I went to church school, so mm-hmm. so you know it, it, uh, it was run by the community of the resurrection. So so we certainly were educated. Uh, I've always said to to put me off for the next thirty five years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, there was an aesthetic dimension that we learned there because there was a school had a very good choir and there was a lovely chapel and so on. But apart from that, it was it was really an appalling education, I think. In, in, in Christianity that we yeah. got. And I would say the same at my school at Rodin. It was very um, hands off, in the head, uh, Anglicanism, and didn't touch the heart in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, the, 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 many of the black sash women were involved one way or other, Jewish or Christian or something, but they mm-hmm. were involved. And so they also and had connections with the church. And, in my connection with um, Dean French Radar and, and the cathedral, that alerted me. But when we moved to Cape Town, I kind of, it all went through the cracks. I lost it. Hmm. I didn't pick up going to the cathedral here. I, I didn't pick up anything. I was just coping with adjusting, really, yeah. you know. Um, but then one day um, in 1980, our youngest son said to me, Mom, there's a nice church over the bridge and they've got a very nice Sunday school and one of my friends wants to go and I want to go. Oh. So I said, oh, great, okay, let's go. So um, we went off hand in hand. Well, Judy felt guilty that she, she couldn't just push him there and drop him off there. She had to go and sit there as well. <laughs> well, foolishly, not foolishly, I don't know. Wisely, the wisdom of God, the archangel was there somewhere. Um, and he said, you can't just dump your child on this as if it's a crash. You, you, you go inside and pay your respects. So I went inside to pay my respects, and there was Douglas preaching. Yeah. I didn't really hear very much of what he said, <laughs> but I saw instead this magnificent colour coming through the sunlight through the Cecilia window above the organ there, yeah. dashing onto the carpet. And I looked at this light, and suddenly God was there, hmm. and full of endless love and endless forgiveness. Mm. And endlessness. Mm. So I was bold on her. I couldn't believe what happened. I came home and wept and wept. My mother said, You had a conversion. I said, Oh, rubbish, don't talk that language. I can't stand it. <laughs> but I also laughed. So I was a bit crazy. I actually just couldn't stop laughing and then I cried. And then, um, you know, so it was a very strong experience. And, and I wanted to go back. And so after six months, I joined the church formally. Mm. You know, I didn't do that in the Anglican church. You were kind of bored and so on. Yes. 
that this was now, you signed on the dotted line. Mm. Uh, and, and so I signed on the dotted line and became very involved, really, um, you know, helping in Sunday school and loving it, loving teaching to children these stories, these marvelous mm. stories. And also, um, uh, you know, with the prayer came and various other aspects of it. And meeting wonderful people. Mm. Oh, the Grushy's backs. Then this, the, the social justice position was so important, and Douglas then moving into leading on the end of cons conscription campaign, the meetings we had in the hall here. This was all very important for our boys growing up, mm. who were very influenced by this, although they weren't churchgoers themselves, mm. but uh, it was very informative for them. Um, and and so, okay, you know, joined the church council, and so I felt this is my home. Thank you, Judy. Well, my, mine was very different because when Judy had this experience, I didn't. <laughs> and I still had this sort of skepticism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, when Judy started to come here very regularly and play quite a role, John de Grouchy, very responsibly, I think, organized an interview with me and came to our house and he said to me, uh, you know, Judy's got very involved and we, we don't want you to feel uh, upset or threatened or left out or anything like that. So, so I said, no, I didn't. And uh, I wasn't against Christianity or against the church or anything, but I wasn't interested. I didn't feel I needed it. Hmm. And that, that was, you know, I, I've had that, as I say, from, from when, I was, uh, when I was at school. Hmm. And, and so it continued. I, I used to come on church camps and things, so I got to know people. And, uh, and there, there were, I, I became aware of things that happened. I always remember Douglas, we were on a church um, a camp uh, in the Cedarburg. And I remember before we started, <coughs> Douglas had a few words about the day. And I, I found something amazing about that, not just doing it, but just for a moment, kind of giving it another dimension. So I was touched by those things. I had a, when I went to uh, J uh, Japan in 1985 or something like that, uh, on, a, on an architectural trip, I was, um, I had an extraordinary experience with a monk there in, in one of the um, uh, Zen uh, temples. And um, when he taught me how to meditate, so completely out of the blue, but it was like quite a mind blowing experience. And then um, in 1988, so it was eight years after Judy had joined the church, I had, I've always said I was attacked by God. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a curious moment because I was actually very angry with somebody who was threatening to sue me because of, I was an editor of a magazine and he was very cross with me. Mm. And, uh, you know, illegitimately cross with me. So I was thinking of suing him, and Judy had gone to church, and I was sitting on our veranda smoking, which I used to do in those days. Mm. And I was uh, suddenly overwhelmed, and, and I was peeled, you know, till I was like the core of an onion, really. Mm. And um, most extraordinary experience. By the time Judy got back, I was just bawling my head away. But I cried, I think, for four hours. And, you know, it was extraordinary, because who should walk in who'd never been to our house before, the one we had? Douglas Bax, he, he suddenly pitches up in the world. It was, it was like an extraordinary coming together of something, you know. That, mm -hmm. So that really is what swept me in. And after that, I battled, but I was sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I slowly became a member of the church until, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're very glad you did. <laughs> Delighted that you're both part of this community. And, uh, yeah. So I want to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, oh, it's been wonderful to get to know you much better. And thank I'm you. sure all the viewers have uh, enjoyed it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much.